Well, what do you think about the election coming up? I know this is a uh, never before seen type presidency. And now uh, I feel like in the never before seen type year, and uh, you know, uh, my lungs are so my lungs are so strong. I blow a breeze, uh, you start freezing, right? Well, COVID, president got COVID. He wasn't breathing that good the other day. Wasn't breathing that good. Oh, uh, you know, for me, I, I see it. This whole thing, America decided to vote. You know, for you know, a reality show not even a reality show, TV show star, a game show host um, who, who was a businessman, who was a game show host, who they call in a reality TV show. And we're getting what we, we're getting a reality TV show. <laughs> and we're entering into the climactic conclusion uh, of, of, of the first season. We don't know if it's going to be a second season, but <laughs> we're coming to the end of the first season. We're at the penultimate episode. You know, the October surprise is definitely the penultimate episode. And, and we're headed into the finale. And we're getting the finale. I mean, it's, if nonetheless, everybody is, no one has been more involved in politics ever than right now. You know, usually when it's the president, the president did something, two or three weeks later, you start talking about the president again. You're not talking about the president every single day. <laughs> you know what I mean? For me, I, I think I value my social media space and, and, and my shared platforms. And I pride myself that I have not said the name of the president once in the last uh, four years on, on my social media, because in some ways, I, they, you know, I've come from the old, uh, uh, the old st uh, st uh, legends or the old concept to never discuss religion or politics on a bar. And I, I think a lot of people on social media are drunk <laughs> <laughs> and high when they are social media. So if you start going back and forth, you know, on Facebook with somebody, you got to assume, you know what I'm saying, that that person had a few drinks and you, why are you discussing politics? And why are you discussing, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I, I'm a, as an American, I still vote with the curtain closed. You know, I, I take pride in that. Um, I vote with the curtain closed. I think this whole thing is the most chaotic political run that, we've ever, that Americans have ever seen. But I think this is what people wanted. People asked for it. They, the, the major, I guess the major, not the majority of voters, but a lot of people had to vote to, to make this happen and they are still going to vote again for four more years of it, you know? So a lot of people are into it. I'm per se, like, I just want the chaos, the political chaos to come to an end. And the one thing I, you know, not one thing, but the, one of the many things I liked about Obama was his calming influence, his calming influence and, and the ability to be presidential and, and, and create an environment of calm he was great at just like telling people, calm down, it's gonna be okay, whatever. And, uh, and, 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 and the guy we have now, you know what I'm saying? It's like a barbecue grill, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> the dude is living, is, is living lighter fluid, you know what I'm saying? Every, every, he just, he just, everything's gotta be a bigger fire uh, and, and blazing even bigger than it is and like really dramatic. And people are getting the show. I think it feeds social media. And I think this is most, one of these most interesting things about social media is the, how people can have people follow them who don't like them. You know how OJ, I think, OJ Simpson got like a million followers now. You know what I'm saying? Like people are following to share whatever negative vibes. I think uh, the, the president is up to like some like 80 million followers or something like that. And I think there's millions and millions of people who are just going on social media every day just to make negative comments. And I, I think that's a, a, a unique uh, circumstance in modern culture that whether it's negative or positive, that people still will respond to it and comment on it. So they're getting the comments. If people are bored in the house, they can just go on Twitter and see what's going on in politics and spend the whole day there uh, uh, interacting. Uh, and, 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 and sharing engagement, whatever's going on. For me, I just think 
I, I'm looking for a sense of calm. I'm, I'm looking for a sense of reason. I'm looking for some assurances. I'm looking for people to embrace each other. I'm looking for people to come together. And people used to say, I, I read on, I read a lot and I read both sides of the story. So I, I'm, I read The Root and then I'll, I'll read Brightboard. I want to hear what everybody has to say. And I, it's just, it was, you know, there was some polarization during the Obama time, but this is the most polarization I think I've ever seen. And uh, I, I just, I'm ready for us. We, we, we're in a traumatic scenario in the first place was what's going on in the world. And I'm just ready for people to come collectively together to fight off the things that we have to fight off. Is there a cure to polarization? Excuse I don't me? know. Is there a cure in your opinion to a polarized society? I mean, usually I would say war. War that happened last time. Alien invasions, you know. Alien uh, invasions. That'll get uh, Earth together. <laughs> war. Um, we, we, we are desperately in need of one. Uh, um, I think, I feel like we were closer uh, during the Obama uh, administration. But, you know, after coming into mo modern times or these latest times and, and, and seeing the both, you know, looking at both sides of social media and checking out the voices of Antifa versus the voices of Black Lives Matter versus the voices of the Proud Boys versus the, vo you know, um, it seems like maybe it was like that before and I just didn't notice it because I was just like, you know, we, we good. Like, you know, we got the president, we good. You know, I was vibing with that and uh, maybe I didn't notice it. But now it's just like, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, uh, I think um, music can be that. Uh, um, I think Travis, when I went to Travis Scott concert uh, and I thought, you know, culturally it was like everybody, you know, just in a mosh pit, you know, all races, all genders, all ages. Uh, I thought it was really cool. Uh, I think music also can um, challenge uh, polarizing ideals and um, I just hope people come together we need people to come together to get through what we're going through right now if everybody could just come together we could possibly beat off the pandemic and other things um, I do think there's some so many important things for black people that have remained not addressed for so long that it's scaring you know some white people it's scaring them to see it's like, it's just, it's, it looks like we're coming out of nowhere with it. Like, you know, like, wow, you know, we want to take down the Robert E. Lee statue. And they're like, why? You guys never wanted to do that before. Like, why? Rob? I'm like, Jewel, like, was not only a slave owner, not only one of the most vicious slave owners in description, not only a sadist who was described as tearing skins, people's skin off their backs, black people, and then throwing salt on it. Um, but then was the leader of a military branch that fought for the legal right to rape, torture, and murder black people. Like, and then I went to Alabama <clears throat> and there's a black high school called Robert E. Lee High School. And I'm like, what, why are black people going to Robert E. Lee High School? I tried to understand it, but then they explained it to me, which I think is so important what's going on with the Supreme Court justice. They said, when, when you complain and want to take the name off of a school, you got to go before the school boards. Then they got to take it to the courts. Then you take it to the courts, then you sue in the courts, or whatever, you know, and those cases go up courts, appellate courts to higher courts. If it gets to a Supreme Court and it's like, you know, the Alabama Supreme Court and it's a conservative Republican court, they vote to keep the name. And then what can you do? You're not supposed to be able to go against the, go against the court. So the only thing you can do then is break the law. So that's why the, 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 this vote, voting is so important because if you want laws to change, they will eventually wind up in the Supreme Court for even some of the most basic things like taking the name of, uh, you know, of a person who just for all means, pur means and purposes could be described as a Hannibal Lecter to black people and take that person's name off of your high school. So um, uh, just generally, that's my vibe. That's my take on that, man. I, I, I want to move off of that. <laughs> I, think it's, um, I think it's an interesting point because, you know, there is another Supreme Court seat that is vacant. Yeah. And, I, you know, every time Supreme Court anything pops up, the Republicans seem to 
to prioritize in a different way than the Democrats do. Of course. And the first thing I think about is Mayor Garland, because that's the first thing my Twitter feed says. And we're in a similar situation, I'd argue more extreme than when, you know, Mayor Garland was the same year. And this is like the same month <laughs> as the election. Right. Um, you know, how do we get that message across to more people? Because I do think there is a lack of understanding in terms of all of the things at risk when it comes to voting. People think that, hey, I, my vote doesn't count when it comes to president, we got the electoral college, right? There's other things like courts. <laughs> like if you don't like, you know, your local high school name, yeah, you, should, you need to be more involved. How do you, how do we bridge that gap? Or do you think I, that maybe this year is the year that that gap is being bridged? I think that it's to the, it's the break voting down to a smaller level. I think that there's this wide, vast idea that, you know, you vote for the president, you vote for the mayor. But I think some of the most important voting that goes on is the propositions. The propositions are local. You know, it's like things that affect your daily life. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying, like, uh, last night I was watching television, and I think they have a, a proposition here. I think it's Proposition 23. And uh, it's something about diabetics and diabetic medicine. And then when I saw it, I'm like, I need to, I need to, I need to read that because if people need help with that, I need to support them. Um, you know, there's people that I've known that had diabetes. There's people that I've that I've known that lost limbs and whatever. And, and there's there's a black man that comes on in the commercial like, if he doesn't get his insulin, you know, he's he's going to die. And this is a proposition that's going to stop him from getting that. So I, I think what happens is things get so vast, and it's the same thing, you know. Again, with music, like I was on your writing. It's sometimes I, I read the story about Louis Armstrong and he's saying like, when I play a concert, I'm playing my concert for one person. I look at the audience and I'm playing for that person and everybody is enjoying me watching, watching that. But he breaks it down that small. And I think we kind of make it too big and we're like, well, the president and then there's the electoral college. And then even though, you know, Hillary won in votes, but she didn't win in the thus and the, and the electoral college needs to be, you know, it's an ancient system and it is, it, it doesn't make sense in our modern times um, that we can't everybody individually vote, you know, and, and, and be counted in that way. At the same time, there's a lot of smaller things that happen that are, way, that are very important and affect our daily lives. And that we need to get to teaching that in fifth grade, teaching the importance. I think a lot of school doesn't teach these things that are very important. Like, what are we voting for? Voting is very important. Taxes you know, vote, vote, voting for that, you know, like, like understanding taxes, you know, like what, 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 it, what it is, you know, um, <clears throat> I've been having a dialogue with, with a few people and we, we've been going back and forth on this is that I believe that we should have digital voting at this point. And many people say, well, you can't have digital voting because the vote can be manipulated. And I'm like, the vote is being manipulated <laughs> right now. <laughs> Paper voting is going to be manipulated. Uh, uh, and, they, and they say, well, you know, somebody can, a hacker can go in. And I'm like, individualized digital codes run our lives right now. Like, you know, when you go and you put your money in the bank, it has now become an individualized digital code. When you spend it with your credit card, it is individualized digital coding. You know, you, you know what I mean? And we're not, I'm not sitting in my house thinking, wow, a hacker is going to go in my bank account and take my money out of it. I'm trusting that the bank will keep my individualized digital code secure. And I think, you know, people are maybe right now, but it's inevitable as we become more uh, digital based society um, uh, and, and our digital technology becomes more connected to us, that it's inevitable that we'll be, we'll be voting with the blink of an eye, you know, with, with the thought. Uh, it's, it's coming soon anyway. So I think to accept that, you know, at some point that we do need to, if I'm going to the gym and I'm using my fingerprint to get in the gym and digital coding for my bank and, I'm, and we're all trusting that safe, that we need to work on getting to that level where everybody is voting and, and, and all votes are counted. But just to get back to uh, what, what you was saying before, how do we make it important? And I think it's important is to bring it to school that third graders, fourth graders, that in history class, as you study history, we should start studying in history class voting and how important that's been. It's important in my family. Um, 
my father, my grandfather was a minister in Louisiana. And uh, um, this is during the time, the parish that my grandparents were, or my parents is from and grandparents had one of the highest rates of lynching in the United States because the whole lynching system was, you know, developed to stop black people from voting. And when we won the Civil War 1865, uh, uh, in 1877, after Grant uh, was no longer the president, there was an election that uh, there was a conflict of who was the, who would be the president, whether the Democrats or Republicans had won. And at that point, uh, the Republican Party was the uh, anti-slavery party and the, Demo the Democratic were pro-slavery, the Southern Democrats. So they made in 1877 what they called the Compromise of 1877. And in that compromise, uh, it was decided that uh, the Republican anti-slavery uh, uh, candidate would become the president in exchange the Southern, the troops that were protecting Black people in the South would be taken out of the South. And that was the only thing keeping the Black power structure and safety intact. And that launched, you know, 100 years of 14th Amendment equal rights uh, protection violations and 100 years of uh, brutal lynchings, intimidation that uh, literally knocked the vote voting numbers down to, you know, super low numbers. So my grandfather was one of those people who was like, you know, he was that dude that, you know, you ain't really want to mess around with, you know what I'm saying? He had, when they tell stories about him, you know, he had a gun under, under, under the seat of his car, gun in the trunk, gun in the glove compartment and another one on him. You know, how said wall of rifles, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm not having it. So he ran for assemblyman two days after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. So for him to step up and do that in a place with the most lynchings where killing black people was legal, says if he is willing to stand like that for voting, put his life on the line for me now today, then by all means, I need to vote. And that's my connect, personal connection to voting, uh, how, how important it is. But uh, I just think generally, we need to start early, not just talking about the president's race, but just talking about being politically active uh, and also talking about the court systems and being pol politically active in those. Uh, I think it's great that I, I talked to about two weeks ago, uh, a woman I went to high school with who is a Supreme Court justice in New York. Her name is, her name is Tanya Kennedy. And uh, I'm just so extremely proud that somebody I know has reached that far up in the criminal justice system because that's where the decisions are being made. That's where the decisions are being made. You know, Jim Crow and all, all the decisions that were the, the things that kept the Ku Klux Klan alive, those decisions all took place in courtrooms. And if people appeal those decisions, it finally reached the Supreme Court. So when we're voting for the president, we're voting for cases that will eventually make it to the Supreme Court. And whether it be, you know, the George Floyd murder or whether it be taking the name of Robert E. Lee down from a high school, uh, those decisions will eventually make it to the Supreme Court. So voting is very important. What was your reaction to, <clears throat> excuse me, California deciding to take a look at reparations? I think that the reparations discussion is one of the most major discussions uh, that the United States has to address. Uh, because, you know, you got a lot of people and they're like, well, you know, I never owned slaves and nobody I know owned a slave. So why do we have to pay reparations now? And uh, I'm like, it's not just about slavery, even though it should be. Um, um, we're talking about cotton in the cotton industry made the United States a superpower that at the time, you know, where, where black people were working for free for corporations day and, and, and day night and night for corporations, making money for corporations, that the South had the fourth richest economy on the planet Earth off of cotton, the most millionaires per capita every anywhere on the entire planet Earth. So this, the economy that we know of America today was built uh, by the enslavement of black people 
and, 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 and the money they made by not paying people to work, not feeding them properly, uh, and being able to work people an unli unlim you know, unlimited amount of hours until they were dead. You know? So these were death camps. You know, like people were literally worked to death. Um, so that's, that, that financial structure was built. Uh, America was built that way. So when the Civil War was over, um, there was a dialogue that black people were supposed to get 40 acres in a mule. And if, if the people from slavery got even that, I think that discussion is an $8 trillion, $10 trillion discussion, minimal, um, if, if that, was, that happened. Um, but instead of being financially rewarded, what actually happened was 100 years of civil rights violations and 14th Amendment constitutional violations, which means that we had the right, there was, we had the right to equal protection as Americans under the law. But there's countless murders that took place that the law turned their back on. There's countless stories of Black people who built up properties and, and built up businesses that those businesses were just taken away randomly and they were killed. If you go to uh, the museums in Alabama, where I spent some time in last year, uh, you could go to the various museums and you could see some of the stories of people who had, you know, big businessmen, black businessmen, who everything they had was taken away. Their land was taken away. They were killed. Uh, and then, you know, we, we're Americans are from uh, Watchmen that start finally get familiar with the story of, uh, you know, Oklahoma. And we're talking about that Wall Street, Black Wall Street was growing to be compar comparable to the Wall Street in New York. Like we're talking about a major financial structure being built that, you know, it was allowed legally for all of those people to be killed, for planes to fly over and bomb the area. And for that in 1919 to happen, those type of violations that happened all over the United States. So it was considered, it was called the Red Summer. It's like so many people lost their businesses, lost, I mean, this has been going on for so long these violations and their 14th Amendment violations. Uh, to, to say civil rights kind of puts it in a different in a perspective. Uh, uh, and, and it does have a, 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 a thought, a vision to it. Because when you think civil rights, the first thing pe most people think is Martin Luther King, the civil rights marches, this type of thing. But we're talking about the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, which says every American has the right to equal protection under the law. That was violated for 100 years. Uh, until, and then, you know, Martin Luther King, they pushed forward and then, and, and black people fought and they struggled and they fought and they burnt cities and they fought back. And then all of a sudden we get the uh, Civil Rights Act passed. And now some people say, okay, well, you guys got the Civil Rights Pass, Pass Act and then it was over. But that's 1964 and Martin Luther King was killed, Dr. King was killed in 1968. So he was killed trying to bring, bring these ideals to life. So, you know, if you were born in the 60s, late 60s or early 70s, we are literally the first free generation of Black Americans. Uh, we're the first generation of people who can operate a business uh, without feeling that that business could be taken away, uh, uh, could, could, could sue or expect a judicial uh, uh, action after being killed. We're the first generation. My mom's generation, when my mom was, grew up in Louisiana, and you walk down the street and a white person walked on the other side of the street, you had to get off the street and walk in the gutter. You couldn't walk on that street. You, if you walked to a store, you couldn't spend over a $10 bill. Your bill had to be smaller than that. Or people would look at you like, what are you doing with that? You can't, you can't even have a bill that high. You know what I'm saying? Like we're talking about the people leaving their homes and having to uh, run away or, or, or leave. You know, my, whole, my mom had 12, 12 brothers, 11 brothers and sisters. Everybody had to leave their home to get away from this power structure where they were not protected under the law. And she's alive now. So when we talk about reparations, I'm talking about for her, like for me personally, like I, I don't, I don't need money from the government. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I have a successful business, but uh, so I'm not saying like I need it, but I'm saying there's a lot of people who are children of that, born into that, 
um, they need reparations for, for that, that need to have refer reparations to address Jim Crow, which is basically like, you can't be where I'm making my money, that, that they need reparations for Southern colleges that Black people's tax dollars paid for for decades, and Black people were not allowed to attend universities that they paid for with their own tax dollars. They need reparations for that. Uh, we need reparations for the amount of people who were uh, uh, mass incarcerated under unfair laws, whose families were ruined because of that, or, or people who like their, their parents finally got a home and then they got arrested on some Trump charge and got you know 50 years in prison for three crack vials where uh, somebody in, in, in a white neighborhood had two ounces and did six months on that. And now that person is doing all that time in prison. How are they going to maintain even the gains that their parents have, have gained? So I think it's not just cash money, it's also land. It's also property. There's a part of America that is owed to the family of foundational Black Americans or Black Americans who, who, who come from a lineage of these massive amount of civil rights violations and, 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 and all the things that have happened that have gotten us to this point. I think, uh, so California, to answer your question, get into that discussion, I think it's extremely honorable. I think it's a difficult discussion to have because actual reparations, I don't think America can afford. You know, if you re America really had to pay, you know what I'm saying, for everything that happened, it might be what, $50 trillion or something like that? Like, I don't think America can afford the actual figure, um, but I think there are some de definitive tangibles that should be offered. I did, and if you watch Watchmen, I go back to that again, I thought it was great because there's this scene in Watchmen where you know, they go to this place where you could put your finger on a button and it would identify your DNA and then trace your DNA to events. And, and, and it is implying that there were reparations that were given to black people who could, who could trace, them, you know, trace their lineage and say, look, you know, my family had 200 acres of property and were worth you know, $20 million in 1918, but you guys bombed it, lynched my great, my grandfather, my great grandfather, took his property, and then told all his family to get out of town by sundown. Who's and, th and now that's a little city, you know? Like they, money's old. So I appreciate the conversation and the dialogue, and I hope it progresses forward, and that we can all collectively come together and figure out how to address uh, things that are can be tried in the court of law. That if we, if, if, if of courts were fair and addressed this fairly, that you know, there are people still alive who have committed a lot of these crimes. There's people with lives whose families benefited from these crimes, that in a court of law, that these things should be able to be adjudicated and come to a conclusion where uh, reparations should be uh, addressed as the uh, a conclusion of that discussion. Right. It's a great answer. <clears throat> I also think there's a lot of opportunity. One thing I did like about T.I. this year, yeah. um, you know, was him, I'll say, take the lead or introduce the opportunity for corporate funded reparations as well. Um, because a lot of these institutions, a lot of beneficiaries of these power structures in history, these companies still around. Yes. <laughs> like you could trace their balance sheet <laughs> and show it. And he pointed out how Lloyds of London essentially snitched on themselves. They said they're, they apologized for the role they played in global slave trades <laughs> around yes. the world. And he called them out. And then Robert Smith was speaking at Forbes this year yes. and said that reparations in the corporate America really needs to take a look and start a discussion around reparations. And then a week later, he was hit with tax payment. Right. Right. So the courts. You know, right. We, we're hoping these things are not linked. It, it does look funny. Uh, uh, it, it does look, you know, really odd. Um, I, I just think uh, it's, it, you know what? We don't know if it's in this lifetime. We don't know if it's now. We don't know if it's today. But we do know that the dialogue is louder than it's ever been. We know that right now, that is closer to being addressed now than ever before because the internet has brought awareness to things that were uh, 
often suppressed to the masses of, of public. I mean, just the fact that, you know, I think Monday is, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day in California over being Columbus Day, you know, I think the internet changed that dialogue, you know, because people started sharing the information on this is what Christopher Columbus did. And this is how he did it. And these are the words that he said, that he literally walked up and was like, wow, these people are so friendly. You know, these people are so nice to us and so friendly. Let's kill them all and take advantage of them. Like, like that's what the, he literally uh, 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 says that in his diary. Uh, um, they, they're, they're there, they're extorting people. They're coming to, you know, take everything, to rape, to pillage. This is what Christopher Columbus, people are starting to see what it is. And, and that's changing the dialogue. So I think in general, uh, the internet, the information that you used to have to go to the back of the library and dig under, dig in the, in the, in the you know, when we were younger, you know, you wanted that, that, that Dr. Ben, that, that stolen legacy, George James, you wanted that, 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 you know, uh, in, you, you know, you wanted that culture. You had to go find it in the backs of libraries and you had to find these books and, and read, but now it's one Google search away for everybody to find out the real information. And that information pr spreads pretty fast now. And then with that in mind, I think we are closer than ever before to reparations. I'm not sure if it'll happen in, 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 in this life, in my lifetime, but I would have never thought it was gonna be a black president either. And, uh, and sure enough, in my lifetime, I did get to see that as well. So I'm hoping that, uh, this is addressed in my mom's lifetime. You know, my mom's in her 80s now, and I'm hoping that what she experienced as a kid that that literally, uh, you know, made her have to leave her home and, and seek a life elsewhere because of just straight up racism and and scary racism. Where you know she's telling me stories now of people who said things or people, you know, like they she told me it's a guy and he was in high school and. He was really good looking and this girl liked him, a, a, a white girl liked him. And it was like the family had to get him out of town because they was coming to murder him. You know, these are stories that we hear, you know, coming from, you know, not, you know, from slavery days, it's coming from my mom, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like one, just a living people who are telling these stories of, of, of things that happen. And um, I'm just hoping in that, in her lifetime and, and, and in my lifetime that we'll get to see an honest discussion and uh, some reparation off, offered to foundational black Americans who built uh, this nation and were hunted and, 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 and ravaged and ridiculed and destroyed as our reward. That's beautiful, man. That's all. <clears throat> excuse me. That's all I have. Uh, is there anything else you want to comment, talk about? You want to let people know about the project, where it's available, videos, visuals coming? Yeah, I'm just you know putting out visuals and, and different uh, uh, motivations. Uh, uh, myself and Dr. Alfie from the Acoma Project that we have a book coming. Um, it's going to have the same name as the album. I want to see you shining. It's a handbook for managing the stress of pandemics, protests, and pain. And uh, that's what the book is about. And it's gonna be in conjunction with the album. That's my next frontier is getting that book out there. And uh, there's be more videos and more songs. And and uh, you could go to the realmarkbatson.com and you could buy the album there for five bucks. I made it, I made it mad cheap. Um, and uh, trust that uh, your, your five bucks is gonna to go to a good place and that place uh, won't be into my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Word up, man. Well, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for this project, and thank you for your words. Thank you, my friend. Peace. Right, peace. Right.